Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2021 Michael and Susan Dell Center Lectureship in Child Health. This lectureship recognizes distinguished researchers and leaders in child health, bringing world-class speakers to the Austin area each spring. This year, we're having to switch it up a bit due to the COVID-19 pandemic and are hosting our first virtual lectureship in child health. We're very excited you're with us today and happy to be able to still host this year's event. I'm Kate Ferris, the Communication Specialist at the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living, and I'm pleased to welcome you all here today to hear from Dr. Iton on the geographical distribution of life expectancy and understanding a new framework for intervening in the social determinants of health. After Dr. Iton's presentation, we will have time for a question and answer period. You can ask questions by using the questions box feature on the right side of the webinar platform. In addition, this lectureship is being recorded and will be available for review along with the slides on our website later this week at msdcenter.org. First, we'd like to thank Dr. Aliyah Husana and her team at the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation for generously funding today's event. I'd also like to recognize the leadership of the center faculty and staff who have put today's details into place. They are Dr. Deanna Helscher, Dr. Alexandra Vandenberg, Dr. Steve Kelder, Dr. Bill Cole, Dr. Nalini Ranjit, Amelia McClellan, Tiffany Menendez, Kathleen Manuel, and Kelsey Heron. This year marks the 15 year anniversary of the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living. Our vision is healthy children in a healthy world, and we've directly reached more than 1 million children and families through intervention projects on population health. We continue to strive to accomplish this vision through our research endeavors and community programs, such as today's forum. To provide a brief overview of our past 15 years, we've invited Dr. Guy Parcell, Dean Emeritus for the UT Health School of Public Health, who was instrumental in the founding of the center. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Parcell. The School of Public Health is a multi-campus school with campuses in the main campus in Houston, but campus is also in San Antonio, Brownsville, El Paso, and Dallas. And the newest campus then really is uh, in Austin in 2007. About the time that Ken Shine approved the approval of the new campus, um, he referred us to the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation to develop a proposal for a health center, for a research center uh, to address the health needs of the children. And Deanna Helscher and Steve Kelder put together a proposal that enabled uh, the, the uh, Dell Foundation to provide the initial funding for the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation Center for Healthy Living. We began uh, in, uh, space that we borrowed from the University of Texas. And the picture that you see there was the grand opening of the campus and the Michael and Susan Dell Center. Later on, we moved into space uh, near the Capitol. And if we can see the next slide. We were in uh, rental space by the Capitol and we expanded our faculty. So we went from uh, two initial faculty or members to about six or seven faculty members. And um, next slide. We then established the first Michael and Susan Dell lectureship in uh, child health uh, to recognize outstanding researchers who are contributing to the knowledge of how to improve uh, child health. And Mary Story, who was also a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee for the center, was our first uh, uh, person that we honored and gave our first Michael and Susan Dell lectureship on child health. Next slide. In the uh, following year, uh, Kelly Brownell was uh, honored uh, with uh, the uh, and gave the lectureship. Uh, I'm happy to say that Kelly Brownell and, and uh, Mary Story are now uh, very close friends. Uh, 
uh, we don't give uh, research participation the uh, credit for that, but happy that we were able to honor both of them as part of the Michael and Susan Dell lectureship. Next slide. We, may, we then uh, began to uh, expand our faculty and expand the number of students that are, were enrolled in the regional campus. And we had a 10 year celebration uh, five years ago. And uh, I was fortunate to participate in that celebration. And we acknowledged the outstanding contributions of the staff that we had been able to bring together at the center and the accomplishments uh, of our faculty. Next slide. The uh, one of our outstanding lectureships uh, in conjunction with our 10 year celebration was the uh, to honor our Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murphy. He was a Surgeon General at that time of our 10 year anniversary. And uh, we're all happy to know that he's our Surgeon General again and very pleased to have him assume that role for our uh, federal government. Next slide. Yeah, uh, this uh, lectureship, we honored uh, Dr. Thomas uh, Robinson, and at the same time, uh, acknowledged uh, establishment of the Phil Nader lectureship in uh, child health. Uh, Phil Nader was my mentor as I was starting out at the University University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. And Phil is a, uh, was a well-known uh, pediatrician who was an uh, uh, outstanding uh, researcher and advocate uh, for child health. Uh, he passed away just a few years ago and his legacy is living on now in a lectureship that we have annually at the center. Next slide. Over the 15 years, the center has accomplished very much. Uh, from uh, our humble beginnings, our faculty have been very uh, uh, productive. Um, over 200 research grants have been uh, uh, funded at the center and the center faculty have produced over 800 uh, publications. Uh, next slide. During the past year, uh, even with uh, COVID, the center has received over 5.5 million in total grants and impacted over 1 million children. The center has grown from a humble beginnings into a proud institution with ties across Austin, across Texas, and across the world. Next slide. This slide shows the logos of the many projects that have been carried out by the center. If you look up in the left-hand corner, you'll see the logo for the CATCH project. That was our very first project that the uh, center carried out. Uh, and now that is one of the most disseminated school-based health promotion programs for children in the world being disseminated not only throughout the United States, but in many countries uh, internationally. The many logos that you see there shows the productivity of the center faculty and the way that they've been able to use the support coming from the Michael and Susan found Michael and Susan Dell Foundation to expand and increase the opportunity for providing programs for children and adolescents. I would like to once again thank Dr. Husseini and the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation for their continued support for the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living. And uh, thank you very much for giving me a few moments to share 
uh, some of the history of the center. When we began conceptualizing and had the idea for the center, I never imagined that it would grow and, it, and have as many accomplishments as it has today. It has greatly exceeded my wildest expectations. So congratulations to Deanna and to all of the faculty and staff at the center. At this time, I would like to hand over moderation of the program to Sandra Vandenberg. She is Professor of Health Promotion and Behavioral Science and Associate Director of the Mike and, Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living. Sandra, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Guy. Um, it was really fun seeing all those pictures and I just wanna say we really appreciate you coming back and doing this for us. Thank you so much. Um, so today we are very excited to have Dr. Eiten as our keynote speaker for this year. Um, Dr. Eiten is the Senior Vice President for Healthy Communities at the California Endowment, which is a private statewide health foundation whose mission is to expand access to affordable quality health care for underserved individuals and communities and to promote fundamental improvements in the health status of all Californians. Dr. Eiten oversees the implementations of Building Healthy Communities, um, which is the foundation's 10-year, billion-dollar, site multi sector place-based initiative designed to improve the health status of 1 million low-income Californians. Prior to that, Dr. Eiten served for seven, year, uh, seven years as the Alameda County Health Officer and Public Health Director where he oversaw an agency with a focus on preventing communicable disease outbreaks, reducing the burden of chronic disease and obesity, and managing the county's preparedness for biological terrorism. So Dr. Eiten's primary interest is the health of disadvantaged populations and the contributions of race, class, wealth, education, geography, and employment to health status. He has asserted that in every public health area of endeavor, be it immunizations, chronic disease, HIV or AIDS, STDs, obesity, or even disaster preparedness, public health practitioners must recognize that they are confronted with enduring consequences of structural poverty, institutionally racism, and other forms of systematic injustice. He further asserts that the only sustainable approach to eliminating health inequities is through the design of intensive, multi-sectoral, place-based interventions that are specifically designed to identify existing assets and to build social, political, and economic power among a critical mass of community residents in historically underserved resource communities. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Atme, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Sandra. Um, every time I hear that introduction, I think, gosh, really? Did I, did I do that? Um, but uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And um, I am not a big fan of these uh, remote kind of uh, settings because I prefer to, to look at people when I'm talking to them and, and see how they're reacting. And you know, there's a whole kind of dynamic uh, being in a room with somebody and, and having a conversation that can't quite be replicated on these screens. So, you know, I apologize from the outset that uh, this is a suboptimal um, kind of setup. However, apparently it's facilitated the participation of a much larger group of people uh, for this lectureship, which is a wonderful thing. So I'm gonna jump right into this. Um, first, share my screen and I'll need some confirmation from somebody that it can be seen. Um, can can you see my screen yes okay great thank you all right so you know i've given this talk quite a few times and it always changes a little bit from talk to talk because they're just things that happen in the news or there are uh, questions that come up from people participating or you know i just get interested in some other aspect of it um, and so i really do enjoy the questions uh, that's how i learn and um, there are a lot of you, obviously, so we can't just do a sort of a free-for-all, but please do ask questions. Um, I, I very much enjoy them. And entitled this, you know, when it comes to your health, does your zip code matter more than your genetic code? 
And you'll see pretty clearly why I say that, um, but I'm gonna try to use some data to illustrate to you the uh, realization that I came to uh, in doing this work. And I think of myself as a, I'm really a practitioner. I live really at the intersection of research and practice. Um, I teach um, and I fund uh, this work, um, but I'm, I'm not a researcher. Um, I, I really, being a doctor, I think there's that sort of general impulse to sort of do things. And, and so I find myself more of a doer. All right, let's see if I can get this to work now. Okay, so uh, it, I'm also a lawyer. And one of the things you learn in law school was to state your conclusions up front. Um, I'm gonna give you some conclusions that I think are false conclusions. Um, first is this general paradigm in American health that health is really about behavior. It's about smoking and drinking and driving without a seatbelt and having sex without condoms. That there are people behaving badly and our job in the healthcare sector is to change their behaviors. Another paradigm is that health is transactional, that it's really the product of the frequency and quality of healthcare services, and that those that have good access to MRIs and CT scans and, and doctors and pharmaceuticals will be healthier than those that do not. And the third is that health is genetic, that it's basically a lottery and that people some people have good genes some people have bad genes and and our job is to sort of you know apply our medical care to those that ended up with the you know unfortunate genetic uh sort of complement and i'll note that all of these are individual frames they're focused on individuals navigating health in a society they're not really looking at communities or populations and so i would argue and we struggle in this country to really translate individual level phenomena into society-wide phenomena. We do this in economics all the time. We talk about microeconomics and macroeconomics, but in health, we have a hard time understanding macro health. And so I wanna offer you throughout this conversation, essentially a look into macro health, the things that are driving health phenomena at the population level and the things over which we have an enormous amount of control. And I'm gonna to argue to you that health is fundamentally political. And one definition of politics is the struggle over the allocation of limited and precious social goods. And when we're talking about limited and precious social goods at the community health level, we are talking about things like a grocery store in your neighborhood or a park or a sidewalk, or in some cases, potable drinking water. Um, these are health protective resources that are allocated through political processes. And if politics is the paradigm that's shaping community health, that means that power matters. Power at the individual level, at the family level, and at the community level. Another conclusion I'm gonna offer you is that health is not health care. I think you know that already. Where you live matters, and it matters a lot. Um, and I'm going to try to prove that to you. And finally, I'm going to suggest to you that health is an investment, uh, particularly public health, whereas health care is an expenditure. And if you want to reduce the expense of health care, you have to invest in health. And there are different things. Um, and our society has a hard time sometimes understanding that. But there are countries in the world that have strong social contracts or social compacts. And those countries have invested heavily in policies, typically in social benefits and social services that actually reduce the demand for downstream healthcare services. And those countries have better health than the United States. So I'm gonna start, of course, the way I like to start, which is to provoke you a little bit. Um, and I realize I'm talking to a bunch of Texans, so you know I have to be careful because I know you all like your guns. Um, but I'm going to read you this quote, and then I'm going to tell you who said it. Uh, if we were in person, I would ask you who said it, and some of you will know. I will say then that I am not nor ever been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. That I am not nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. And I will say in addition to this that there's a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. And inasmuch as they cannot so live, while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior. 
And I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having a superior position assigned to the white race. Well, some of you probably know that that was Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator. And many of us have been to the Lincoln Memorial, and we see the words of the second inaugural address and the Gettysburg Address carved into what I presume is marble at the Lincoln Memorial, but we don't see the words, the, the overtly white supremacist words of Abraham Lincoln carved into marble at the Lincoln Memorial. And I, I have two questions for you, which again, if we were in person, I would actually ask you. The first is why? Why don't we carve, I mean, this was from an 1858 um, series of debates that Lincoln had with uh, William Douglas, uh, the, the Lincoln-Douglas debates um, all throughout the state of Illinois when uh, they were both running for the Illinois uh, Senate, uh, Lincoln lost. Um, but Lincoln was trying to justify the fact that despite the fact that he was anti-slavery, he was pro-white supremacy. Um, and we've kind of whitewashed that aspect of Lincoln's history. Um, and the question is why? Why don't we tell that story? Why don't we tell the full story of Abraham Lincoln? We recognize many people believe that he has evolved, he evolved over his time. But white supremacy was the, was the essentially the narrative of the United States um, in those days and continues to this day to be a dominant narrative that shapes policy. And then policy creates conditions. And those conditions essentially either make it easier for people to find health protective resources or more difficult. Okay, so I'm st I start with narrative intentionally. One, I wanna sort of perk up your attention. I wanna get your, I wanna get you captivated by this. Um, and I want you to understand the role of narrative. Narrative is, is super powerful. Narrative shapes policy. Policy creates conditions. So this image is two, it's basically a, it's, it's a dichotomy. There are two sort of dominant narratives in the United States. One is a narrative of exclusion, which is basically Lincoln's narrative. Um, you know, that, well, you know, I may not be pro-slavery, but I'm certainly not about equality. And that there's a difference between the, the races and, and I don't want them to be voters. I don't want them to be jurors. I don't want them to marry white people. Um, you know, there's a supreme uh, position for white people and therefore the spoils of the society are really for white people. Um, that's the narrative that I'm depicting on the right side of this. It's just kind of a darker narrative. It, it excludes people and their, their full humanity. And then it's a competing narrative in this country, which is a narrative of inclusion, which basically says that we're all born equal and we're all entitled to the full spoils of this society. And there are aspects of that inclusionary narrative that are enshrined in both the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. So I'm putting to you that there's a war between narratives in this country, and it's been that way even before this country was founded. And it's not unique to the United States, but it's particularly exemplified in the United States. There are a lot of background themes, policy themes that run through our society. Income inequality is one. Mass incarceration is another one. Student level protests on campuses, a global refugee crisis, Black Lives Matter. Obviously, we've had the Chauvin a verdict in the past few days. Uh, Moral Mondays in, in uh, North Carolina, which is uh, essentially breathing life into Martin Luther King's Poor People's Campaign. Indigenous people's uh, uh, rights, the Standing Rock, um, undocumented campaigns, more recently anti-Asian racism and violence. There's a theme that runs through all of these campaigns, all of these efforts, and that's the theme of exclusion. That these are communities who feel like the narrative that's creating policies or opportunities in their lives is excluding them from meaningfully participating in the, in the full spectrum of American citizenship. And that exclusionary narrative is dominant. Um, a narrative of exclusion does three things. It's a very simple thing, and it's um, I'm going to illustrate it in a second with a, a couple of real life uh, situations. But it does three things. It, the first thing it does is it has to dehumanize the target of the uh, exclusion. And, and Lincoln did it beautifully. He said, you know, I, I think there's a physical difference between the white and black races. I don't think that they should serve on juries. You know, you've heard about uh, our former president when he announced his candidacy for president of the United States, talked about Mexican-Americans bringing drugs, bringing crime, they're rapists. 
we've heard narrative about makers versus takers or um, you know the Chinese flu, uh, welfare queens, crack babies. Those are all very intentionally designed pejorative narrative descriptors to dehumanize the target of that popular of that particular narrative. The second thing that a narrative of exclusion does is it exaggerates the notion of scarcity. It suggests that there aren't enough resources for all of us, and therefore any um, opportunity for one group comes at the expense of another. We're in a zero-sum competitive, essentially, struggle between competing tribes. And the third thing it, it does is it looks to the past nostalgically. It talks about, you know, how we were a great country at one point, and it ignores racism, slavery, genocide, you know, the incarceration of Japanese, the exclusion of Chinese, uh, a whole host of anti-woman uh, policy, uh, anti-LGBTQ policy, and it looks to the future fearfully and says that, you know, essentially people are coming to take our things and we have to defend ourselves against them. That's a classic narrative of exclusion. Narratives are very, very powerful. Narratives motivate extreme behaviors. We saw this in January 6th at the Capitol. If you think about it, the folks scaling this wall at the Capitol have a narrative in their heads that's motivating them to assault the US Capitol. In their minds, there's a stolen election. Something that was theirs is being taken away, and they need to reclaim it. Narratives are extremely powerful. They shape policy. Policy creates conditions. Uh, some of you remember in 2010 or so when the Affordable Care Act was being debated around the country and a number of legislators went home to their districts and had town hall meetings. This is a Republican Senator Arlen Specter in Pennsylvania uh, being confronted by some of his constituents, many of whom were armed because they felt that the extension of universal health care to all Americans was taking something from them. And they felt motivated by this narrative that essentially something for somebody else is taking it from me. They felt motivated to show up at these town halls armed about universal health care. Okay, so that's a narrative of exclusion. Let me talk about the narrative of inclusion. Now, the narrative of inclusion does almost the exact opposite, but not quite. The first thing it is it does is it changes the narrator and it lets people tell their own stories and allows people to humanize themselves so that we see our shared humanity in their experiences. We see ourselves in them. The second thing it does is it shows how we our fates are inextricably intertwined and that you know no man is an island. The third thing it does is it looks realistically to the past and it tells the truth about our history, um, a balanced truth, the good and the bad, um, and acknowledges that we can't go forward the same way that we've come to date. We have to correct some of these um, egregious mistakes of the past. And it looks to the future with purpose and hope. Okay, so let me talk about place and why place matters. This is where I grew up. Um, it's a beautiful city. Uh, it's an old volcan all volcanic island that sits in the middle of a river. Uh, it's got beautiful housing stock and uh, wonderful parks and recreational spaces, outdoor cafes, a state-of-the-art subway system. This is Montreal, Canada. In Canada, Canada has a strong social compact. I grew up in Canada in the 70s and 80s, and this is a view of, of downtown Montreal with the St. Lawrence River in the background, McGill University in the foreground, looking down from Mount Royal, which is what gives Montreal its name. Um, Canada's social contract is very strong. Uh, universal health insurance, universal dental care, universal child care benefits, uh, universal paid sick leave and vacation for all employed Canadians state-of-the-art public transportation in most of the major cities, highly subsidized post-secondary education. I went to McGill University, which they refer to as the Harvard of the North. Um, I went to McGill for free and could have gone to McGill Medical School for free. 
um, highly subsidized um, community resources, libraries, sports leagues, the like. If you want to assess a country's social contract, you only have to look for one word, and that word is universal. And so you'll note the word universal throughout Canada's social contract, and you'll see that um, in other countries' social contracts too. In the mid 80s, I left Montreal to go to Baltimore, Maryland, to go to Johns Hopkins Medical School because somebody told me it was the best medical school in the world. I don't know whether that's true or not, but what I was confronted with when I got to Baltimore were these scenes that were immediately adjacent uh, to Johns Hopkins Hospital in East Baltimore, uh, where I was living to go to medical school. And I had never seen things like this before in my life. And I was being toured around by an upperclassman and uh, he saw this look of shock on my face and asked me what was wrong. And I, I managed to stammer out something to the effect of, when was there a war here? Because uh, I had they, there were bombed out buildings and burnt out cars and garbage piled up to your knees and mangy dogs and huge rodents running around. And there were babies playing in and amongst all of this. And, and it looked to me like Beirut, like the, at the time Beirut was, uh, you know, Lebanon was a, a part of the world that was being bombed routinely. And this looked to me like Beirut. And so I, I managed to stammer out to this fellow, when was there a war here? And I'll never forget what he said to me. He looked at me with this look of utter disdain. And he said, what did you expect? It's the inner city. And from that moment on, my life trajectory has been set because he was telling me that I should have expected these conditions in a major American city. And that it was, we had a name for it. It's called the inner city and I should have known. And having grown up in Montreal um, where you don't have inner cities, you don't have conditions like this. I, I was shocked by this, but even more shocked by the fact that this was his expectation, that this was an American norm. And I thought to myself, well, what if I had grown up in East Baltimore, Maryland, like this kid? I mean, this kid had no more control over that environment than I did over the environment that I got to navigate uh, in Montreal, Canada. Yet this kid has to navigate these conditions every single day of his life. And these kids aren't stupid. They know they're being devalued. They see it. They feel it. They internalize it. And it changes their behavior and their perspective on the world. And it shapes their health irrevocably. And the question for me was, what do we owe this kid? This kid is me. What does the society owe this child? Years later, um, I ended up in South uh, Indiana um, doing some work. And for those of you who uh, are familiar with Southern Indiana, um, it's very rural, um, very remote. Uh, it also had uh, a distinction in 2015 of having the world's largest HIV incidents. Um, Southern Indiana, this is Austin, Indiana, Scott County uh, was undergoing an outbreak of, of opiate uh, abuse, uh, a drug called Opana. And uh, this drug was being ground up and injected using relatively large bore needles that were very efficient spreaders of uh, HIV and hepatitis C in Scott County, Indiana, ended up having uh, incidents of HIV AIDS that was greater than Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Scott County, Indiana is 98% white. And I asked myself in dealing with Scott County, Indiana, you can look at the uh, census and the, the census statistics are similar between Baltimore and Scott County. The only major difference is that Scott County, Indiana is 98% white, Baltimore, East Baltimore, probably 70, 80% black. And to my mind, this was two faces of the same coin. This was the black and white face of income inequality in the United States. And this is the result of the absence of affirmative policy, the absence of a social contract in the face of abject need. And so we create we manufacture social vulnerability in this country. And then we act surprised when vulnerable people actually succumb to inevitable threats. And the question for me was, what is the American social contract? And again, if we were, if we were together, I would literally pause and ask you to tell me what it is. 
Now remember, right? I said that if you want to find a strong social contract, look for the word universal. Um, and most social contracts around the world uh, have that word in them multiple times. Um, so I, I just ask you to reflect on what are the universal policies in the United States that are designed to invest in people's well-being so that they have um, you know, a good shot at being able to participate in the larger uh, economy and, and opportunities in society. Okay, so I left Baltimore with this question in my head. When it comes to your health in the United States of America, does your zip code matter more than your genetic code? And so I told you I would try to prove this to you, so I'll show you how I tried to prove it to myself. Um, years later, I became the health officer and, and health director in Alameda County. For those of you who don't know California that well, um, this is the San Francisco Bay Area, which is kind of midway up California. Uh, that's the city of San Francisco that's uh, circled there. And then this is Alameda County across the bay, and it has 18 cities in it, including Oakland and Berkeley. And I became the health officer uh, of Alameda County. And I'm showing you the picture of Alameda County because it's shaped like a boot because I'm going to show you some maps in a second. So the foot part of the boot is really where the urban density is. And then you have suburban sort of cities down the, towards the heel and then another set of suburbs up uh, along the laces. And then the back part of the county is mostly rural uh, with a lot of agriculture and um, some other industries. And so when you're the health officer uh, in a California county, you're the registrar of all births and deaths. And there are about 20,000 births in Alameda County every year and about 10,000 deaths. And for those of you who are data junkies like me, and I'm sure there's some of you on this, uh, on, on this Zoom, um, this was a trove of information that I was delighted to find myself responsible for. Not only uh, did every death certificate have to have my signature on it, but the death certificates could be refused. We could refuse to register a death unless the data was accurately completed on the death certificate. So it's a fairly decent source of good epidemiologic data. So we took uh, 400,000 plus death certificates and constructed a database in Alameda County. On every death certificate, you know what somebody died of, you know what their age was when they died, their race, ethnicity, and where they lived. Now that data is not always perfect, but it's pretty good. And so we took, as I said, close to half a million death certificates and we looked for patterns of death across Alameda County. We wanted to tell the story of how people died in Alameda County. So we took the boot, this is a map of Alameda County now at the census tract level, there are about 150 census tracts, about 10,000 people in each, and we calculated on average how long somebody could expect to live in each of those census tracts. So how long you could expect to live in your neighborhood. Um, and for those neighborhoods where life expectancy was less than 74 years, we uh, colored those in in red. Uh, for those where it was greater than 80 years, we colored them in green, and in between uh, 74 and 80 years is colored in yellow. And you'll see when you look at this map, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see it, you see clustering of the red areas. And it, it makes, it forces you to ask the question, well, what's happening in those red areas? Why are people routinely dying earlier in those red areas than they are in the yellow and green areas? And those areas, as I mentioned before, are in the sort of more urban, uh, older parts of Alameda County in the foothills of Oakland and Berkeley. Um, and then along uh, an interstate where there are some unincorporated areas uh, in Alameda County, you also see some uh, red areas. Now this was, a, this was a map that caused a lot of controversy, um, got a lot of attention. It ended up on the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle and it stimulated significant debate. It actually, in fact, helped lead to a documentary called Unnatural Causes. And many of the questions people asked were, oh my God, um, how is this possible? Uh, and then some people took it a little further and said, um, well, this must be unique to Alameda County. Well, I knew that that wasn't true. So we took our little map and we decided we'd go around the country and work with health departments around the country to reconstruct some of this analysis. First place I had to go was Baltimore, Maryland, because I had been to medical school there, and this was the place in the world that stimulated me to think like this in the first place. And there are neighborhoods in Baltimore where life expectancy is on the order of 58 years uh, in certain neighborhoods, and then other neighborhoods where it's approaching 90 years in the same city. Similarly, in Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, 
We found a neighborhood in East Cleveland called Huff with a life expectancy of 61 years and another one called Lindhurst about 1.8 miles away with a life expectancy of 88.5 years. Uh, both of these maps ended up on the respective front pages of the newspaper, the Baltimore Sun and the Cleveland uh, Plain Dealer. Um, we went to Denver, uh, we went to New York City, to Seattle, King County, to Los Angeles, Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, to Boston, to Philadelphia, to San Antonio, uh, to Chicago. We also went to um, Cincinnati and St. Louis. And we're still looking, we're still quite frankly looking around. Everywhere we look, we find life expectancy differences on the order of 12, 15, 20, 25, 30, in some cases, more than 30 years, like Chicago. Uh, and the question for me is no longer, is Alameda County unique? Is, is, that, is there any place in the United States where you don't see this phenomenon? This is the, the way that we essentially distribute opportunity in this country. It's by place, it's by neighborhood. And this cumulative and synergistic impacts of depriving people of health protective resources in places like East Baltimore create measurable differences in lifespan. And, you know, we started telling people, give me your address and I'll tell you how long you're going to live. And we can do it. We can guess right most of the time, not because we're smart, but because these patterns are so rigid and replicable that they just create essentially this, this phenomenon of, of constrained health opportunities by neighborhood. Okay, the other thing you can do for the data junkies, uh, you know, in the crowd, is you can do what are called bivariate analyses. You can take life expectancy, which is the upper left um, graphic, and then uh, poverty from the census tract, and you can correlate those two things and you get a bivariate analysis with life expectancy on one axis with higher life expectancy, higher, and then poverty on the other axis, neighborhood poverty. Um, as you move from left to right, you're moving from relatively wealthy communities to relatively poor communities. Each of those blue dots is a census tract in Alameda County. And as you move from rich to poor, you see life gets correspondingly shorter. And that there's a cost uh, to living in a poor neighborhood and you can measure that cost in the length of life. In an ideal world, this should be a flat line. How poor you are or how poor your neighborhood is shouldn't predict how long you live. But in this country, it does. Um, and it does it quite, uh, um, quite easily. We did the same analysis for the entire San Francisco Bay Area, which is about six and a half million people. We did the same thing for the entire state of California, about 40 million people. Um, more recently, we've decided, I, I engaged a group of Canadian and American researchers to do some comparative analysis. And so we decided we were gonna look at California uh, counties, and this is a group of California counties, that same analysis I showed you, life expectancy versus poverty rate. And all you have to look at on these graphics is the slope of this line. Essentially, for the nerds in the audience, uh, these are regression lines, and we already calculated a regression coefficient in R squared. Um, and, and for the non-nerds, just look at how unflat that line is. A flat line is an equitable distribution of, of essentially life. Uh, a steep line suggests that um, wealth and death, um, or wealth and life are correlated, and poverty and death are directly uh, proportional to each other. And so these are a number of counties uh, in California um, and we decided we wanted to compare that to uh, some metropolitan regions in Canada. Um, so just look at the, the basic slope of these lines. These are the California counties. These are the Canadian metro areas. And what you see, I'm going to go back for a second, California counties, Canadian metro areas. What you see is that the Canadian lines are much more shallow. They're not perfectly flat, except in the case of Vancouver, which is almost perfectly flat. Um, but they're much more shallow, meaning that where you live in Canada doesn't constrain your health nearly as much as where you live in the United States. And this is a summary of all the California counties and all the Canadian metro areas. And what you see is not only are the Canadian lines flatter, they're also higher. Um, and that's what we've seen in international comparisons, that the flatter the line is, the higher the line is, meaning that um, equity actually benefits everybody, including wealthy people. 
In the United States, we tend to see steeper lines that are lower. So even people on the high end are lower than their peers in other countries. Uh, you can't put these kind of things on the front page of the newspaper, and I'm in the business of trying to communicate to people. So what we did instead is we monetized the slope of the line in California, which basically we just said, well, what does it cost? What's life cost in the uh, uh, San Francisco Bay Area? And we concluded using the slope of that line that every additional $12,500 in household income buys you a year of life uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. That's the cost of life uh, in, in San Francisco. A lot of people, not a lot of people, some people said to me, you know, uh, during various different presentations of this data that, you know, I had it all wrong and that I really didn't understand the United States of America. And, and the problem with my analysis is that I was lumping in together rich and poor, white and black. And the reality is that if I wanted to see who the healthiest people in the country were, I should just look at white people. Um, because the United States is a very generous country. It takes in all of these immigrants and the immigrants come over and they're sicker. And, and we treat them in our healthcare systems and over time they get healthier. But they're the reasons that we have poor health in this country. And so just look at disparities. Um, but if you wanna see healthy people, look at white people. And I said, okay, um, I'm gonna make some more slides. The first thing that um, I do, I like Time Magazine covers because they tend to speak the truth. This one's called the Sorry State of American Health. Um, this is a graphic that you've all seen. This is per capita spending on medical care uh, at the US compared to other developed countries, so-called OECD countries. And when you do this analysis, you find that the US is roughly twice um, on a per capita basis, the average of OECD countries. We spend twice as much per person on medical care than other developed countries in the world. We know that. And for that, we get relatively poor results. But a couple of women researchers, Elizabeth Bradley and Lauren Taylor, uh, did something that many people hadn't thought to do before. They took that same data, which is now in the blue, that's per person spending on medical care, and they added to it per person spending on social services and benefits. Um, so in other words, the blue line is identical to these red lines that I showed you in that first graphic. And then the sort of red rust color is per capita spending on social benefits and services. And when you do that, this interesting thing happens. The US is no longer the big spender. On a per person basis, we're kind of in the middle of the pack compared to other developed countries. The difference is that we disproportionately spend on medical care and disproportionately underspend on social benefits and services. So I would argue to you that that red line is essentially the level of investment in the country's social contract. And what Bradley and Taylor found, and they wrote a book uh, about this called The American Healthcare Paradox, which I encourage you to read. It's a relatively short book and it's very compelling. Um, and this is them doing a TED talk not too long ago, they concluded that for every dollar spent on healthcare in the rest of the developed world, roughly $2 is spent on social services and benefits. In the United States, we're almost the opposite. For every dollar spent on medical care, we spend only about 55 cents on social services and benefits. And the consequences of that, they argue, is that the ratio between social spending and medical spending predicts health. The ratio of roughly two to one social to health is the ratio that correlates best with the health status of that population. Uh, so the healthiest countries spend roughly $2 on social benefits and services compared to medical care. Again, the US spends only 55 cents. Um, if you don't believe Bradley and Taylor, you can look at the Rand Corporation, which replicated their study actually did a much larger study and including looking at each of the 50 United States states. And they concluded um, in their study that Taylor and Bradley were exactly right. In fact, even more right than they thought they were. This graphic, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but you're welcome to any and all of these slides. Um, and this comes right out of the RAND report. Uh, it looks at the difference between EU, the European Union and US social spending. Um, and that, those are those darker lines uh, at the top, the dark orange and the dark blue. And you see between 1980 and 2010, there's this fixed gap between uh, European Union social spending and US social spending. And then the sort of the faded lines, um, the orange is 
um, EU life expectancy and the blue is US life expectancy. And you see in 1980, those two life expectancies were roughly the same, but over that 30 year period, you see the EU, European Union, pulling away from the United States in terms of life expectancy. And then those dotted lines at the bottom, the blue is US health spending and the orange is EU health spending. So you see this reverse phenomenon in the United States healthcare spending is pulling away from EU health spending on a per capita basis. So they concluded at RAND, and this was, this was sort of the take home, which I think that if you're gonna to listen to anything that I say, just try to take one of these conclusions and recognize how powerful it is. They concluded that higher levels of social spending are strongly associated with better health. In other words, if you want better health, spend more on social services and benefits. They went on to say that the association is particularly strong for public, i.e. government spending on social services and benefits, as opposed to private social spending. They also noted that the association between social and health outcomes is strongest where income inequality is greatest, in places like Texas. In other words, social protection may be more important to health outcomes in more unequal societies, in places like Texas. By the way, California too. And then they go on to note that the associations observed across countries also hold across region of a single country, such as the United States. In other words, they did this analysis looking at the 50 states, those states that spent more on a per capita basis on social services and benefits had better health than those that did not. Okay, I told you that um, people told me that I needed to look at the health of white Americans because I had my analysis all along. So I did. And um, US light, white life expectancy is about 79 years. It's actually dropped the past few years. This is a, a 2015 statistic, um, which actually over it, overestimates US white life expectancy, but it's about the same as uh, the, the overall life expectancy of Costa Rica. Uh, but U.S. whites are living shorter lives in Belgium, Chile, Denmark, Lebanon, Slovenia, Austria, Finland, Germany, Greece, Ireland, Malta, Netherlands, Portugal, the U.K., of course, Canada, Cyprus, France, Iceland, Israel, South Korea, Luxembourg, Monaco, um, New Zealand, Norway, Sweden, Andorra, Australia, Italy, San Marino, Singapore, Spain, Switzerland, and Japan. Uh, there are 33 countries in the world that have longer life expectancies than U.S. whites. In 1990, there were only 17. U.S. white life expectancy has been plummeting uh, over the past 30 years. It's in fact so bad now that many health disparities researchers no longer use whites as a benchmark. Um, it's, it's too low a number. Um, we're better off using Asians or, or, or quite frankly, Latinos when it comes to life expectancy or any immigrant population. Every single immigrant population in the United States has better health statistics than its native born uh, peers. And then as immigrants acculturate, their health actually gets worse. Uh, America is not good for your health. We could learn a lot by studying the health of immigrants to improve the health of Americans. Okay, don't believe me. That's one of the lessons I, I try to impart to students all the time. Do your own research. Um, don't listen to these yammering, talking heads on screens. Um, read this stuff yourself. Um, you know, for instance, look at the Institute of Medicine or what's now the National Academies of Medicine report called Shorter Lives, Poorer Health, that they looked at US overall health compared to um, 17 peer countries. And this was their overall conclusion. The panel was struck by the gravity of its findings, struck by the gravity of its findings. For many years, Americans have been dying at younger ages than people in almost all other high-income countries. This disadvantage has been getting worse for three decades, especially among women. The US health disadvantage cannot be fully explained by health disparities that exist among people who are uninsured or poor, as important as these issues are. Several studies are now suggesting that even advantaged Americans, those who are white, insured, college-educated, or upper income, are in worse health than similar individuals in other countries. Okay, typically I would take a break now and ask people, what do you think? Are you surprised by that? Did you know this? Uh, but we're on Zoom, so we can't do that. Um, so I'm gonna keep going.
Um, this phenomenon has been noted by the PBS NewsHour asking why so many white Americans are dying young. Uh, this is the Wall Street Journal looking at the decline in life expectancy for U.S. white women. This is another article, I don't remember who it's from, but um, they use the term deaths of despair, which I wanna uh, delve into a little bit. Um, that term was popularized by these two economists, um, Angus Deaton and Anne Case. They're a married couple at Princeton. Angus Deaton won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2015. Uh, their work includes uh, looking at mortality rates amongst working class whites, or actually ac across whites in general. This is one of the graphics that they produced in one of their reports, um, which looks at mortality rates now. So mortality rates are almost the inverse of life expectancy. You want to see mortality rates going down over time. And that's what they in fact showed across a whole host of industrialized countries. Um, including uh, in that, that dark blue, bright blue line is uh, U.S. Latinos. But they used, looked at U.S. whites, which is that red line, and you see this phenomenon that is really kind of discordant with virtually every other major population group in the world, uh, in the developed world, excuse me. And you see U.S. white mortality not only not declining, um, plateauing and possibly accelerating uh, in, in the early 2000s and, and beyond. And this phenomenon, they termed, after looking at the causes of these deaths, which were disproportionately um, self-inflicted causes, uh, alcohol-related organ disease, um, overdoses, and suicides. And the scale of this is huge. Uh, it's greater than all of the deaths from the entire U.S. HIV AIDS epidemic combined. Uh, as an epidemiological phenomenon, this is an enormous phenomenon of premature white death, and it's been getting worse. Um, so I'm going to reach my conclusion in a minute, um, although you've already heard it because I stated it in the first few slides. Um, I spend my time basically trying to shout this from a mountaintop, um, that we kind of got health all wrong in this country. We're spending disproportionately downstream on medical care. We're underspending on social benefits and social services. We're using a paradigm of individual behavior, genetics, and access to healthcare, when really at the population level, it really is about access to opportunity and the structural barriers that get in the way of people being able to access uh, health protective resources. So these are real zip codes in California with real life expectancies and real zip codes and real high school graduation rates. We spend time trying to get the attention of legislators when Sacramento, which is our capital, built a new airport terminal. We literally decorated the terminal with uh, these messages and legislators started calling me, asking me why I was decreasing property values in their districts. Uh, downtown San Francisco, when the American Public Health Association was held there a few years ago, we decorated uh, downtown San Francisco with these images, similarly in San Diego at APHA a couple years ago. Uh, we put these messages around. Why are we trying to get people to pay attention to this? Because it's known, and it has been known for many years, that 80 plus percent of what influences your life expectancy has nothing to do with doctors and you know wonderful nurses and, 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 and people working in the medical system, despite the fact that they're doing great work and they're working very hard. Um, they're necessary, but nowhere close to sufficient to try to improve the health of the United States. Um, and why is that? Let me just let me just bottom line it for you. Um, when I showed you that kid in East Baltimore or that picture of the woman in Southern Indiana, um, these folks are living in stress incubators. They're living in environments where the resources that they have at their disposal don't come close to the threats or the challenges that they face on a day-to-day -day basis. So they're in a state of imbalance. Their threats are high and their resources are low. And the gap between threats and resources is manifest stress. That's called allostatic load. That's the fancy scientific word for chronic stress. When you're constantly trying to find resources to deal with your threats, but your resources only come in at this level, you are in a state of panic, a state of stress. And so people living in those red areas that I showed you on the maps, the low life expectancy areas, 
are essentially bathed in a fog of chronic stress. And so that's what this uh, illustration basically shows you. The stress manifests itself in many ways. All human beings react the same way. We perceive the stressor. We send a message to our pituitary gland. It sends a message to our adrenal glands, which releases uh, a cascade of hormones, amongst which is cortisol. In the acute phase, which is in the blue, cortisol is good for you. It allows you uh, to mount physiologic responses to a challenge if you need to run or if you need to essentially fight. Um, cortisol helps you rally those resources. But if you're constantly bathed in cortisol, which is in the red, it has deleterious effects on your health independent of your behavior. It causes cardiovascular disease and um, hypertension, glucose intolerance, uh, insulin resistance. It causes inflammation, turns down your immune system, and it causes atrophy and cell death in the part of your brain that's necessary for the kind of what's called executive function, which is really kind of making decisions for the long term. Okay, so let me conclude here uh, with this framework, um, which is a framework that was created by myself and some other public health practitioners because we were frustrated that the medical model framework really didn't provide the kind of tools that we thought in public health were necessary to get upstream and address some of these upstream determinants of health. So the downstream model was basically medical care. And medical care is a $3.8 trillion enterprise in this country. And it largely says that if you see premature death, you're, you're, you're seeing the result of higher burdens of morbidity, essentially chronic disease and uh, injury. And when you see high levels of chronic disease and injury, you're seeing essentially high levels of risk factors. And those risk factors are typically categorized in two ways. There's so-called risk behaviors, the smoking, drinking, driving without a seatbelt, and then there's sort of like general risk factors that may come from having familial hypercholesterolemia or something of that uh, uh, nature. And so our job in the healthcare system is to try to reduce the risk typically through um, individual behavioral change with pamphlets and brochures and health education, all of which is necessary. Um, try to tinker with people's genes um, through a variety of different strategies, which tend to be very expensive and, and marginally beneficial at best and to try to change the trajectory of, of disease through 15-minute encounters, generally in a cubicle, uh, with a, an expert such as myself or one of you, um, essentially with a patient who is um, there to absorb as much of our wisdom as possible in that 15-minute encounter and change their lives. I'm being a little bit cynical, but not terribly cynical. And we argue that all of that downstream stuff is necessary, but it's insufficient and that we need to organize our strategies upstream to attack these problems. The first part of my talk, I talked to you through essentially how we think those problems um, manifest themselves. And um, they're essentially in three categories, social inequities that are driven by institutional policies and practices, largely you know, government, but also private sector policies and practices, and that those are ultimately driven by a narrative. And that narrative, as I said, at its root, has two forms. One is a narrative of exclusion, one is a narrative of inclusion. And whichever one of those narratives dominates, it shapes the policies and the conditions downstream. When you look at health disparities, um, you're talking about downstream. When you look at health inequities, you're talking about upstream. Inequities are structural, unfair, unjust barriers to people's opportunity. You can take the word health out and talk about inequities producing disparities, or if you're simple-minded like me, you talk about conditions producing consequences. And I often describe downstream healthcare as damage control, and that we spend a lot of time managing the consequences of inequitable uh, policy upstream. And it's not just healthcare that downstream consequences manifest themselves in education and employment and a whole host of of human outcomes. And our argument was to essentially look upstream and figure out how to simplify and construct a set of strategies and practices to intervene earlier. Um, and to, in essence, rebuild our social contract in the United States. And so we simplified upstream to, and I've been saying it throughout this talk, narrative. You can change the narrative. It's not immutable. Uh, and we've done so in California in any number of different ways. Narrative shapes policy, policy creates conditions. Those conditions are most often manifest in places like East Baltimore or South Indiana, 
um, but not exclusively. And they also manifest themselves in populations like uh, immigrants or LGBTQ or disabled populations, uh, where you have a structural inequity making it difficult for people to fully participate uh, in society. Healthcare costs live downstream, true health lives upstream. Health is an, ex health is an investment, healthcare is an expenditure. I'm gonna stop there because I really do wanna get uh, to some questions. So let me stop sharing my screen because all I see on my screen is my face, which is not necessarily the most lovely thing to be looking at for an hour. Okay, hopefully my screen is no longer being shared. Your screen is good. It'd be nice to see your lovely face. <laughs> Thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, I, this is for, hopefully for all of our um, audience, this is a very, very important topic. And um, the way you presented this was so clear, what, you know, what needs to happen. Um, not necessarily easy, right? <laughs> the solution is not easy, but um, so anyway, thank you very much. Um, I just want to say if the audience has any um, questions for Dr. Eiten, please put those in the chat box and we will try to answer as many as we can. And if we're unable to address all the questions that we receive, we will include the answers on our event recording webpage at um, the childhealthlectureship.org. And there are some questions here in the chat box, and I can just go ahead and read them to you. Um, if that does that seem like the best way to do this? Okay. Great. First one that I see um, is there an association between climate, environmental health policy, and life expectancy and population health? Wow! Right out of the box, we get that question. That's <laughs> that's great. Um, <laughs> Small question. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's obviously a, a huge and important question. Um, I'm going to give you the short answer and a little bit of the intermediate length answer, but there's a much longer answer. And and this is obviously from our perspective, the work that we've been doing here. But um, we believe that you can't create a world um, that has inequitable policy and um, essentially has ecological imbalance. In other words, to the extent that you have ecological imbalance, you're generating waste. That waste is generally toxic at some level. And because you have inequity in society, that toxic waste gets associated with the people who have less power. So you can't essentially you know, separate um, sort of an approach to the environment, which generates toxicity and waste, and an approach to people that treats some people as being less valuable because it means that the waste gets dumped on the uh, people who lack uh, power. And, and so there's no point talking about um, these policies if we're not also talking about climate change um, because we know that the consequences of climate change will fall more heavily on those people that lack power. And similarly, I, the, the, the frame here is really social vulnerability and the extent to which it's manufactured. Um, and uh, other countries around the world try to mitigate social vulnerability through policy. So that's what a social contract is. In this country, we essentially don't. Um, we construct social vulnerability and then we're like confused when we see COVID replicating the patterns that the foreclosure crisis uh, you know, illustrated, or that uh, Hurricane Katrina illustrated, or that a heat wave illustrates, or that HIV AIDS illustrates. So you know, we have to stop you know, acting like we're surprised about this. We've, we've created the social vulnerability. Of course, those are the people who are gonna be most impacted by whatever threat comes down the pike. Climate change is the most ominous threat slow moving, overwhelmingly powerful, and will disproportionately and more earlier impact those populations that are socially vulnerable. So you can't separate those two things out. That was, believe it or not, the short answer. Yeah, thank you. 
So uh, the next question that we have here is, does our belief in a meritocracy lead to a deliberate policy to underspend on social services? Yes. Um, and hopefully, um, if you ever get a chance to invite Raj Chetty uh, to give a lecture, uh, Raj Chetty is an uh, economist, uh, has done enormous research. He, he somehow managed to get access to 50 million US tax records uh, identify tax records, um, which allows him to look over 30 years at intergenerational wealth. And he essentially has constructed this model of the American dream. Um, you know, will you essentially ascend to a higher level of, you know, essentially wealth and economic mobility than your parents uh, in your lifetime, or at least up until the age of 30? And what he showed was that if you want the American dream, you're much better off moving to Canada. Uh, it's twice as likely to essentially move from the lower rungs to the upper rungs in Canada than it is in the United States. In fact, the reality is that in the United States, the, the, the American dream is largely dead. Um, it really doesn't happen. And he's shown this using our own tax records, our own data. Um, so not only do we have a myth of a meritocracy, we actually have data which shows that it does not exist. Um, and it's particularly bad when you talk about populations of color. So I do think that uh, although immigrants have this really kind of remarkable counter story, um, which is similar to their counter story in health as well. Um, so I do think it's a myth of the meritocracy. This is a this is part of the narrative of exclusion. I mean, it's a, it's a device used in the narrative of exclusion to essentially ignore abject need. I mean, the fact that we have, you know, millions of people that lack health insurance um, in Texas and in other parts of the country, um, and we say, well, you know, if they worked hard, if they got a job, I mean, they need to, you know, work hard like the other people who have health insurance. Well, we know that that's complete nonsense. We know that, you know, your ability to essentially predict who's going to need health insurance at any given time is, is zero. And therefore, um, it's, it's literally a lottery in most instances. So um, this idea that only those who essentially not worked hard get sick and somehow deserve what they got is, is, is beyond absurd. Um, yet we use that to structure policy around healthcare and healthcare access. So yes, I think that's one of the most pernicious myths um, in this country, and it's tied into that whole narrative of exclusion. Thank you very much. Okay, we're getting many questions now, so we're going to kind of we're kind of like sorting through. And again, we will answer all of them, but um, we may not get to all of them right now. But we will do it on the website. Um, here's one. Says so this is an amazing talk. Thank you for it. How do we change the trajectory of what feels like a bullet train that has been on the metaphorical track for 40 plus years? Well, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about California here and, and not to say that California is perfect, it is not. Um, but in the mid 1990s, California looked like the rest of the United States. We had a governor by the name of Pete Wilson and we had a lot of policy that was basically exclusionary policy. We had this thing called Prop 187, which denied undocumented people access to schools, never mind a whole host of other social benefits. And 67% um, of Californians voted for it. Um, and it was essentially, uh, you know, driven by a governor who really used a narrative of exclusion to, um, to great benefit uh, for his own political uh, career. We had Trump, a version of Trump, really, you know, 20 years before the United States had it. And then you fast forward 20, 25 years, and we now have policy in California uh, where undocumented people can get driver's licenses, they qualify for in-state tuition, they can become doctors and lawyers and take the bar, um, they have access to um, health care. Uh, we cover all undocumented people up to the age of 26 to parallel the Affordable Care Act. We're now pushing policy to cover seniors and we hope to cover the entire population um, you know, of all Californians with policy. Well, how did that happen in a state that 20 years before was pushing to exclude undocumented people from schools. Well, that's what narrative change 
is. Uh, moving from a narrative of exclusion to a narrative of inclusion is real work. Um, there, there are conscious efforts to change the narrative in California about who belongs. And that idea of, you know, we all belong and we all contribute and we all have the shared humanity can be created through conversations like I described, um, changing the narrator, allowing people to humanize themselves um, and, and structuring policy to reflect um, our shared humanity. And so California has made the transition. It's not perfect. We still have a lot of issues to deal with. We have income inequality, we have housing inequity, we still have mass incarceration, um, but we've made the transition in a narrative form from a narrative of exclusion in 1994 to a narrative of inclusion in 2021. And uh, the consequence of that narrative change has been a whole a litany of policy changes that are inclusive, that are investing in rebuilding our social contract. So to the extent that there's hope, we, I like to say I'm from California, therefore I'm from the future. Um, California predicts um, policy in the rest of the United States. We just are generally 15 to 20 years before the rest of the country. So what you see happen in California today will happen to you tomorrow. Um, and the only question is, how do you want to prepare for it? That's a really interesting view. It'll be fun to watch the next few years and see it play out. So here's a question. Uh, what would you recommend to future public health policy students that want to create change in Texas? Wow, great question. Um, so one thing in particular, perhaps, and that, well, maybe two things. Um, one is that, you know, what we, we spent a billion dollars in California, which sounds like a lot, it's really not a lot in, in a state this big, um, over 10 years uh, to try to understand how to use a social determinants of health approach to improve the health and well-being of uh, 14 low-income communities across California. And we learned an enormous amount. Um, one of the things that we learned was what we call the ABCs of this work. A stands for agency, which is basically power. Um, it's the ability to essentially shape um, outcomes that impact your life, both your individual life, your family's life, and your community's life. And you can build agency. And Texas has an example after example of this, of organizing people, organizing people in communities to essentially use their collective political power to essentially reshape the agenda uh, in, the, in, the, in the democratic forums in which they are, you know, operating. So agency is the A of ABC, and I would say to um, public health practitioners anywhere in the country, including in places like Texas, and as I was saying earlier in, in the conversation we had, not on this talk, but um, with Alexandra and Gianna, um, you know, we have our Texas is in California. We have our Central Valley, we have Orange County, um, where we have very conservative politics, um, where we have to navigate uh, these issues very carefully as well. Um, so the first thing I would say is that you have to build social, political, and economic power in a critical mass of people that are most impacted by the inequity. They have to be participating politically to hold systems accountable for an equitable allocation of resources, including things like parks and grocery stores and getting rid of fast food and liquor stores. Um, so agency is critical uh, to practitioners, and as I like to say, in the old days, when you're working in government, you've got to build political power of your constituents, but you've got to try not to leave any fingerprints because politicians don't like it when you're essentially rabble rousing. Uh, they like to do the rabble rousing. So um, public health has to facilitate organizing, but oftentimes it's difficult to actually do it directly. The B of ABC is belonging, which is what I was talking about, you know, around narrative, this idea of who belongs. Um, who's entitled to uh, participate in the full benefits of society. And the narrative shift is really one from othering, which is a narrative of exclusion, to a narrative of belonging, which is a narrative of inclusion. And California has made that leap. And, and the thing that I would say to practitioners of public health is don't assume that the narrative is fixed. You can change it. Um, and you can change it to great effect. And that's, in fact, what we've done in California. We've invested uh, in changing the narrative. 
And when the narrative changes, the policy changes. And when the policy changes, the conditions change. So the challenge with public health practitioners is that we think that we're just about the science and the data. And there's so much evidence that shows that science and data don't drive policy. They're necessary, but not sufficient. So what you have to do is you actually have to align your message with a set of clear values. That's what narrative is. It's about speaking to what are our values? What is our identity? Who are we as a people? And you can participate in shaping that narrative. And if you win, you get the benefits of that narrative on policy. And you can bring data into the policy conversation after you've won the narrative battle. That I think uh, that answer was perfect and actually uh, addressed several of the other questions that were on here. So um, I thought that that um, worked really well. So thank you very much. I didn't say what the C is in the ABC. The C is conditions, fundamental <laughs> conditions. And those are the things that are addressed by the social contract. Um, you know, they're, they're essentially how people are situated and their opportunity structures as opposed to programs and services, which are basically remedial. You want to get at the fundamental conditions. That's what the C is of ABC, agency, belonging, and changing conditions. Excellent. Thank you very much.